So the Opal Tower was featured in a Design Excellence series. Let's have a look. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Heiser Says. Now, some people have been sharing a link to a video that was just released a few days ago by the architect for the Opal Tower, Bates Smart. And it shows a lecture, a presentation, a design presentation at an event. And it's the Council on Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat. They had an event in Sydney at the Hassel office, big firm there, and the Opal Tower was featured. Now, this was from the 19th of September when the event occurred. And, you know, you had to pay 35 bucks. It looked like a good event. But they've only released it like the 31st of last month, like five days ago. This video has just appeared. Uh, and it seems insane to be doing it now with all the stuff in the press that's coming out about this building. Even if you're proud of the design, you, you don't want to be uh, pushing it right now. It's not the smartest thing to do. It, it, it seems quite odd, to be honest. I think it might be a pre-programmed post. Maybe they, they've... Because I for my architectural practice, I have you know about a year's worth of content that I've just got programmed to go up on YouTube. So every week I have like a video appearing and then it gets sent to my LinkedIn and it just keeps the channel moving. And uh, I suspect that's what's happened here. So let's let's um, have a look and see what's going on here. Wait, let me just make some adjustments to make sure we can see it all. Okay, I'll turn this on. We'll watch a little bit of this and we'll just talk about it. Uh, so next we have Matthew Lasseur from Bait Smart. So Matthew is studio director at Bait Smart with over 20 years experience. His design work has re resulted in some of Bait Smart. That is such a crowd of architects there. <laughs> I wonder if I recognize anyone in the audience. I've got to see. It's Sydney. I know a few people that work down there. But, you know, you go to these things. Look at them. None of them are holding it. Oh, one wine glass. Yeah, I, I used to drink a lot more when I went to this stuff. Art's most progressive residential and commercial high-rise projects and competition wins. His work includes, spoiler alert, the Opal Tower at Sydney Olympic Park, 1 Denison Street, North Sydney, and the super high-rise scheme for 8 Parramatta Square. He has a special interest in developing new high-rise typologies with innovative residential and commercial floor plates to increase density and urbanisation, lower environmental impact, and improve the everyday life of users. Thank you, Matthew. So, I mean, it sounds good. He's got his introduction here. Um, let's watch a bit more. Thank you, Claire. Thank you very much. Um, just before I start, if I could let everyone know that uh, I've just completed three weeks of recovering from laryngitis. I don't know if my voice is going to make it through the rest of the night, but if anyone saw me sculling from a brown bottle in my shoulder bag about 15 minutes ago, I can assure you it was only cough mixture. Yeah, uh, sure, mate, sure. Um, I feel fabulous, but I don't know if it's going to hold up. Let's see. Um, I think if we were to uh, outline two things that we were really trying to achieve with the design of the Opal Tower from day one, um, the first would be that we wanted to enhance the degree of amenity that was available to residents in typical residential condominium towers. Obviously, when faced with a design competition for a residential tower, um, there are many different facets that you can look at being unique. And This just sounds really strange, <laughs> knowing what's occurred. In some ways, it's quite sad. They, they probably should take this down and not really show it at the moment. Wait a few months before they put it forward because people are thinking this is a joke. They're, they're, they're commenting going, this is a joke. What's going on here? I mean, this is a, a typical architectural presentation. You know, he's explaining the concept. He's putting it forward. Uh, but people are not in the mood to hear this. And being... Um 
special, I guess, or unusual in, in the marketplace, what we really tried to do was drive an approach here that this should be a tower that offered outstanding amenity to residents. What really struck me about Sydney Olympic Park when I went to go and visit it the first time was just that, the amenity of the location, the amount of open space, the amount of sunlight, the amount of views, the amount of greenery. If we could just increase the quality of life above the average apartment building in this building by just one notch, we felt that we would be happy with the result. I mean, that's an enviable goal as an architect to achieve. And you often have, have to understand, I feel sorry for the architect in, in this project because they're going to cop some reputational damage and they would have had, uh, honestly, I would imagine no capacity at all to actually have any say on what was happening in the construction. Very rarely these days. Back in the day, the architect would be administering the contract and you'll be the person acting between the builder and the, uh, the client, the, the person who's procuring it, the developer. You'll be the impartial professional between the two. Those days are long over. Often, you'll do the first stage of a project as a design and then you'll get seconded to the builder. You'll be put underneath the builder and you'll be working for them. So then, you know, you may have a vision, you may have an idea, a concept that you want to achieve. You may have developed this whole project with the client. But now because you're working under the builder, you're essentially under his control. And then the traditional communication lines between you and the original client, which could have been the developer, are completely cut and you have to communicate through the, the builder. So if you're on site and you notice an issue and then you go around the builder to inform your original client, you're breaching your contract. You can get screwed. It completely removes any of your authority or power. I, I'm not sure how this was procured, but I would be shocked if it wasn't procured in a similar type of way. It, it's just much too common these days. The second thing that we really sought to do was to create a building which is truly of its place. And that means a building that if you were to pick it up and put it somewhere else, it should fail. It should not be relevant. It should not belong in that location. It should be something which is truly of its place. Um, our vision, we've said, is that uh, Site 68 or Opal Tower is where Olympic Park meets Bicentennial Park, where the city meets nature. It is simultaneously the edge condition, entry marker and gateway. In response, we've created a unique triangular shaped tower that is a slender entry marker to Olympic Park while also responding to its pivotal location. The soft corners reflect the elliptical towers further along Australia Avenue, while vertical gardens and horizontal planters continue the landscape of bicentennial parklands into the third dimension, up into the building. That's good architecture spin there. Very good, he's selling it. I'm used to this, guys. This is, this, is, this is part of what we do as architects. You have to sell an idea, and he's doing a good job. Environmentally, our design cleans, filters, and cools air, provides cross-flow ventilation to apartments and common areas, shades apartments in summer while admitting winter sunlight. Yeah, I'd, I'd question a few of those, th you know, those claims, particularly the cross-flow ventilation. All of that stuff changes when you're... You know, when people start closing doors or covering smoke detectors with plastic. The building will be the next generation of environmental apartment living at Olympic Park. Here is the location. Do I have a pointer? I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously, this is the site location. And what immediately struck us was the absolute panora panoramic views towards uh, the south and towards the east of the site. Um, this is Bicentennial Park. It will never be built out. Uh, you can see the Parramatta River effectively um, from, from the site. Uh, this is Sydney Olympic Park in this area here. And the whole of Sydney Olympic Park has a master plan called uh, Sydney Olympic Park 2030, which envisages the large um, the, the largest proportion of this area becoming high-rise um, commercial and residential development. So what we really had was, uh, a, excuse me, sorry, a building or a site that was at the perimeter of Sydney Olympic Park, um, separating Sydney Olympic Park from the Bicentennial Parklands. And if anyone can understand why I've just gone a little nervous and stumbled over a few words, it's because I saw my boss walk in through the corridor just there a second ago, so bear with me. <coughs> um, the site is also very much at a prominent corner between Australia Avenue and Benelong Park. If you're not in architectural design, you don't know how many of these type of analysis drawings you do to get to this concept. You know, I bet you he would have sat down for hours and hours just looking at the different concepts, looking at the concept, context, developing a, an idea. It's not as easy as, uh, as people think.
Parkway and it effectively represents a gateway into Sydney Olympic Park. When you arrive into Sydney Olympic Park to go to one of the main stadiums, particularly from Eastern Sydney, you arrive along Australia Avenue and Site 68 is the very first site which you come across. So therefore, we've said that this is a gateway building and that the building itself should represent the fact that you've arrived in Sydney Olympic Park. The site itself sits on an axis between Australia Avenue, um, the bicentennial parklands, which is a pedestrian route running right the way through the parklands connecting to a railway station, and obviously has a corner interface along here in, in the third axis. The site also sits at the end of a string of towers along Australia Avenue. Australia Avenue continues up towards the railway station and the town centre of Sydney Olympic Park. There are a number of tall residential buildings already built. This building would be the final in a string of tall towers along Australia Avenue. So you're seeing the beginnings of an architectural presentation here. And uh, we'll just jump ahead. Uh, we'll jump ahead a little bit more. So you can see, you know, he's getting the... Uh, developing the site geometry and here we go orientation for views I think this is important with regards to where they're putting the slots obviously solar access north and east east and south for the views we studied a whole series of different options in terms of um, how the amenity of different floor plate configurations could work um, in a triangular site we started with a, a triangle uh, and we looked at what percentage of the floor plate could achieve solar access, what percentage would be affected by noise, what percentage could achieve views. And we studied a number of different floor plate types to understand and then assessed by our own sort of uh, internal discussion matrix, we came to the conclusion when balancing all of these issues that on balance, um, the triangular form represented the greatest um, outcome in so far as um, amenity, and also in terms of the civic legibility of the tower form. So they've done quite a rigorous design here. And here we go. Let's, let's have a look at the, the floor plate principles here. We then introduced um, three deep cuts or slots into the floor plate. And these were intended to bring daylight and natural ventilation deep into the core. I mentioned earlier that we were really trying to design a... He's one of the aims of bringing natural light deep into a building is that it's very hard to achieve and you get these dark, dead, depressing spaces inside these apartments. And just walking in those spaces every day has a psychological effect on people and it affects their mood and just the, the way they live. Just go, go, to stay, go to a holiday unit or an apartment complex and you can see how that's not achieving this, how depressing it can be. A building that was of its place and what we couldn't ignore at this particular point was that this building <clears throat> was in an enormous amount of greenery it was surrounded by parkland and the building itself would be sitting in a park so we started to think to ourselves how can we um, how can we make um, the building speak to its context how can we bring the context into the building and the way we started to think of the floor plate was as three leaves three leaves that gradually came together to form a triangle to wrap around a core. And then once we introduced the slots into the core, you could see that we effectively had three leaves of accommodation wrapped around a central core with slots, which enabled light and ventilation to get. Often those type of, the three leaves concepts is a kind of, I don't know, it depends on who you talk to. Sometimes that comes quite late as the idea and it's this, the marketing spin put on top of the original idea, which was you know, putting these slots in there to get light deep into the building to sell it, to sell it. I mean, I, you know, the concept here seems seems quite good. I think it's, he's achieving what he's want to achieve, but just the timing of this, guys, you need to get your social media person under control. Get into the core at three points along each of the corridors. We then started to look at how we could articulate this, this floor plate. The first thing we did um, is study the unit mix and work out how many apartment types we needed of uh, different quantities and on what floors they were going to go. And we were actually able to come up with a very rational way of breaking down the vertical bulk and scale of the building into a series of stacked volumes, uh, which exactly relate to the different types of floor plates. So there are five or six, five different types of floor plates in here expressed by these stacked volumes. And then we alternated the slots on every floor so that the garden slots between each stack would alternate around the tower to create a dynamic movement of the garden slots as you moved up the building. 
So everyone who's having issues with the developer and the builder, those garden slots are an intrinsic part of the design that's meant to provide you with amenity according to the architect. You've got you know, it's right here. It's right here. So you should be compensated for losing access to that amenity while they're repairing it. It's only fair. The resulting form was one which presented an entry gateway um, and responded to the three axes of Sydney Olympic Park, Australia Avenue, Bicentennial Park um, Parklands here, the, the Bicentennial Park route, uh, and Australia Avenue in this direction here. So it was a corner or a gateway building um, emphasising uh, its, its central location on those three axes. It was also um, a pivotal location at the corner as you arrive into Sydney Olympic Park on the corner of Australia Avenue and Bicentennial Park. Okay, so we'll push ahead a bit to have a look. And you can see he's explaining the facade design. It's just showing how that colour would be applied into the spandrel of the building. Um, these were operable windows along <coughs> above a high level fin. We had a low level fin here with operable windows at the lower level to allow ventilation through upper and lower levels. The horizontal fin would change in colour as it wrapped around the building. And you can see this particular matrix was the pattern that was applied to the building. <clears throat> and the pattern was informed through studying the bark of the trees in Bicentennial Park, looking at the patterns within the bark and applying our three green colours in a pattern which was reminiscent of the bark that we had studied, but also making sure, obviously, that it lined up and could be a truly 360-degree um, pattern. So, so, you know, they put a fair bit of effort in here. But I, I think if you'd like to watch the whole presentation uh, in context, I'll put a link to this below. I, I just think the timing isn't very good because the issues are in some of these slots. And even though, you know, they've done a, a good job with the design and with the concept. And frankly, I really hope that they weren't administering the contract and it, uh, checking it every day because it doesn't look like they have. It, it looks impossible to me that they would have done that, that they would have had that responsibility. With project managers these days, they don't want to pay architects to do these type of things. And um, it just seems like really bad timing to release this. It does. So guys, let me know what you think. You know, Do you think the design, uh, you know, the presentation of this concept is a bit insensitive, given... You know, the fact that the people getting kicked out of the apartment. Do you think it's a, a junior HR person that may not know what's going on or, or a social media expert? Let me know what you think in the comments. Please like, share, subscribe, ding the bell, and I will see you next time. Bye for now.